Hello, and welcome to Home Space and Reason, a podcast about creating a home that thrives. Hi there, I'm Christina Browning, your host. If you know your home could be so much more than it is, I discuss home functionality, aesthetics, and automation. I'm the home functionality coach and realtor. I geek out on various subjects regarding your home and yard, challenging you to think of your space differently to get the most out of every square foot. I pose questions for you to think through about your space and your reason. This podcast is all positive, offering you virtual fist bumps and celebrating every win. Remember, there's no such thing as perfect, but you can still aim for your best every day. In this episode, let's discuss home functionality as it pertains to the pleasure of the space that surrounds your home, specifically in attracting hummingbirds, Butterflies and Birds. Episode 27. Earth Day is an annual event celebrated around the world to demonstrate support for environmental protection. There are mental health benefits of being able to see birds and shrubs and trees around the home, whether you live in an urban space or a neighborhood. For those of you who enjoy country or farm living already, you know this that I speak of. According to the National Pollinator Garden Network, pollinators are responsible for one out of three bites of food we take each day. And yet, pollinators are at a critical point in their own survival. Many reasons contribute to their recent decline. Increasing the number of pollinator-friendly gardens and landscapes will help revive the health of bees, butterflies, birds, bats, and other pollinators across the country. I thought it would be appropriate to publish this podcast on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. Two years in a row, I have ordered caterpillars for my son. They arrive so tiny, in a container pre-filled with the food they need, and he gets to watch them grow and eventually cocoon. Watching the metamorphosis into a butterfly is a wonder enjoyed by all three of us in our family, and we love releasing them into the wild once the weather is warm. The process of a monarch's complete transformation from egg to larva to chrysalis and into an adult butterfly takes between six to eight weeks. And I'm excited that you're listening today because I want to talk about attracting hummingbirds, butterflies, and other bits of wonder that make an outdoor area so much more idealistic. Adjusting our outdoor environment, the furniture, the rug and plants around us, and even the pollinators we hope to attract are examples of thought and feeling regulators. Have you chose your regulators with intention or did you simply buy the first plastic outdoor chair that you saw when walking into the store because you needed something to fill your patio? And if that's the case, should you reconsider? Your outdoor space can either relax you or stress you out. Is it comfortable or do you look at it like, that looks like so much work? Do you want to linger? Do you hear birds? Do you see butterflies? Consider all the bits. If you need to re-listen, you can look over your notes on episode 26, 27, and episode 28 coming next, and make decisions with deliberate intention. Butterflies and moths belong to the second largest order of insects, next to beetles, with approximately 170,000 species worldwide. Yesterday, all of our caterpillars had gone through all the stages and were enjoying their new wings as butterflies. It was a sunny evening and the temperature was right to release them, so off we sent them, venturing into the big world. 
Creating this episode presents a unique challenge since I have listeners now virtually in every pocket of the world. And when I consider speaking on attracting wildlife, everyone will have vastly different climates, spaces, and abilities. Because of that, I wanted to start with the concept of planting natives. When we originally built our home, I wanted to plant what I liked to see, regardless if the plants were native or not. For example, I love the easy feeling of a palm tree in the wind, and because there are cold, hardy versions that survive in Oregon State now, I happily planted one in the front flower bed at the corner of our house. But the more I've read, the more I've learned, and I'll discuss some of that with you today. I'm going to take a quick second for station identification. Have you subscribed yet? If you haven't, please take a quick minute to do that. So as I release new episodes, they come to you automatically. Yay for automation. I promise to always deliver the same high quality content that you're accustomed to with me. Now let's talk about birds. A great place to start for attracting birds is identifying the ones that frequent your region and then determine the habitat that appeals to them. Of course, plants are usually part of this equation. When you consider attracting birds to your yard, one of the best reasons is for their insect eating appetite to control pests without any effort by you. But to do that, Much like a hotel, you need amenities, baby. If you have a few birdhouses, a bird bath, a feeder, and several plants of varying heights, the greater the variety of birds that will call your home their preferred bed and breakfast. So our home that we built backs up to a piece of property that has very mature, old, pine trees. It's stunning. We put in a wall of windows that folds open like an accordion so we can enjoy those trees. And my thought was, how fun is it going to be to watch the birds? I put out a bird feeder and filled it with seed and it quickly all rotted. I tried a different kind of seed and it also rotted. I tried a different kind of feeder. Nothing. Silence. Crickets, but no birds. I tried everything for a couple of years and failed miserably at attracting birds. Now my parents can accidentally drop a peanut out of their coat pocket and they've got 15 species and a family of squirrels running after them, but I found it incredibly challenging to attract birds. And the only thing I can figure is maybe there's some predatory hawks or something living in those trees behind our house. Provide birds with food and shelter during all four seasons by planting trees and shrubs that offer seeds and fruit. Some of these shrubs can do double duty as excellent choices for hedges. So when you are considering how to shield the neighbors from looking straight into your kitchen window, a green tall shrub might be a far better choice than a fence because you can provide shelter and housing for birds with the same plant. Also, who wouldn't rather look at nature instead of a fence that requires upkeep anyway? Stay tuned for episode 28 on green fences. Consider planting ornamental grasses too because they provide seeds and nesting material as well as places to hide. If your garden is less than one acre, put up only one birdhouse if you want to attract a particular species. However, purple martins, sparrows, and swallows are not territorial and will reside in a community of housing. With Audubon's native plant database, you can find the best plants for the birds 
in your area. Growing bird-friendly plants will attract and protect the birds you love while making your space beautiful, easy to care for, and better for the environment. Explore all of your native plant resources on their website, and it includes a fact sheet on creating a native plant garden and how it can save you money. I'll put a link in the podcast notes. I want to read to you an excerpt by Katherine Towler from an article she wrote back in 2016 titled, Why Do Writers Love Birding So Much? My husband and I spent much of our free time in remote places, walking the trails and fields and dirt roads looking for birds. We seldom meet anyone in the wildlife refuges and bogs we regularly visit in northern Vermont up on the Canadian border. Over time, walking in these landscapes empty of humans has a cumulative effect. I slip into the world of birds, I listen for distant calls and songs, I study the leaves for the slightest sign of movement. My husband and I are one in the silence searching without speaking. Not only is my speaking voice stilled, the voices in my mind are stilled, given over to something purer and richer. The air on my skin, sunlight and birdsong, the brilliant colors of a Blackburnian warbler. For many years, birds were a reminder of outdoors glimpsed through the window while I sat at my desk writing. Chickadees came to the feeder in the maple trees in the yard. Occasionally, a hawk perched on an upper branch, and I consulted the bird guide to try to determine which species it was. I had an interest in birds just as I had an interest in gospel music and Vietnam War novels. It later goes on to say, Being a writer means living in an inquisitive state. I am constantly turning over my own experience, looking for the stories beneath the surface and questioning my hidden motives and the motives of others. Writing demands a strange double vision, with a gaze focused simultaneously outward and inward. In order to write works of substance that speak to our times, we must be connected to human society and culture, but the act of writing requires separating from the din of people and news and striving. In the years I've spent writing three novels and a memoir, I've shut out a great deal. I have stayed sequestered in my house for days on end and maintained almost a maniacal focus on myself. With birds, I have found another way of being in the world. The time devoted to watching birds is about nothing but what is right there in front of me. I am released from myself instead of sent deeper within, I am immersed in the senses and freed of turning that experience into a narrative. Until I went out looking for birds, I did not understand how much I hungered to leave the self-consciousness of the writer behind. Anyone can become a bird watcher, but the number of writers who have revealed themselves as birders in recent years and written about birds suggests there might be more than a casual connection. I sought out a few bird-watching writers to learn how they see the relationship between their work and the time they spend with birds. This is such a lovely viewpoint of exactly why birding or attracting birds or any wildlife is therapeutic and good for the soul. Catherine does such a lovely job articulating it that I couldn't possibly paraphrase, so I put a link to the entire article in the podcast notes. Now let's discuss hummingbirds. Surprisingly, hummingbirds are only found in the Western Hemisphere, with almost half the species living around the equator. Around 5% of hummingbird species live primarily north of Mexico, and only about two dozen species visit the United States and Canada. A few species remain year-round in the U.S. along the Pacific coast. 
Not all hummingbirds feed at the same height, so plant a variety of shrub sizes and climbing vines for food sources. My favorite plant for attracting hummingbirds is the cigar or also called firecracker plant. It originates in Mexico where it becomes two to three feet tall in warm and sunny spots. At our house, they only get about 12 inches or so tall. It's an annual here in Oregon, but in other areas, it can be a perennial. I have read it will come back each year in Mountain Brook, Alabama. I was mesmerized to see on Instagram a post by a gal in the San Juan Islands. I tried to go back and find that post again to give her credit by name, but I wasn't able to find it in my conversation history. She had many hummingbirds flocking to her feeders, and we have one guy who patrols our feeder and chases off any bird who dare look at it out of the corner of their eye. When I asked her about this, she told me the key was putting several food sources close to each other because a tyrant can defend one feeder, but he cannot defend more. What experience do you have with hummingbirds? I have historically thought of fuchsias as being an annual where we live, mostly filling front porch hanging baskets. But last year I learned there was a hardy version, and sure enough, it did come up again this year. They are also hummingbird magnets. Hummingbirds consume about half their body weight in bugs and nectar, feeding every 10 to 15 minutes and visiting 1,000 to 2,000 flowers throughout the day. In addition to nectar from flowers and feeders, these birds eat small insects, beetles, ants, aphids, gnats, mosquitoes, and wasp. So hummingbirds are great to have in your backyard. I thought, you know what? If I can't attract a bird, let me switch gears and try something else. And I've been far more successful at hummingbirds. We had a resident guy, kind of a tyrant, who defended his feeder like his life depended on it. And so we only had the one dude. But our neighbors two doors down have a very successful year-round hummingbird feeder that attracts a few. And so we knew that there was comfort in year-round accessibility to food, and these particular guys didn't migrate. So we thought if we could keep that up all year round, we can also attract and keep some hummingbirds. Now let's talk about butterflies, shall we? Did you know that butterflies have a hard time flying when it's windy? I never thought of that. So planting butterfly-friendly plants near a wall or hedge can yield good results. Planting your color in clumps helps attract hummingbirds and butterflies with their eyes in the sky. When you think of planting to attract butterflies, flowers provide color as well as nectar and seeds. Trees and shrubs bear nuts, fruit, and berries and offer shelter breeding places, and nesting sites for birds and butterflies. I've put a link to my Pinterest page where I have butterfly-specific planting ideas pinned to my outdoor spaces board. Ponds, fountains, or other water elements accent the garden and provide necessary moisture and drinking sources for birds and butterflies. Your main butterfly nectar plants should receive full sun from mid-morning to mid-afternoon. Why? Because butterfly adults generally feed only in the sun. If sun is limited in your yard, try adding butterfly nectar sources to the vegetable garden. Butterflies sip moisture from mud puddles. In the garden, small lids or concaved rock can create tiny water sources. Large stones provide sunny perches for them to warm their wings. Make sure you have planted host plants for caterpillars, as well as plants that will attract the mature butterfly. The monarch specifically is in trouble. Their numbers are down 90% of what they were in 1992 due, in part, to the milkweed plant population being down, which is indispensable to the monarch. Milkweed plants are the only source of food for the monarch caterpillar. 
They're rapidly disappearing because of the loss of habitat from land development and the widespread use of weed killer on fields where they live. An easy way for you to make a difference today to promote the recovery of the monarch population is by ordering and planting milkweed. I will provide a link, as always, in the podcast notes. Another fun idea is to gift milkweed seeds and explain why. If you've got a wedding coming up in the next year and you need an idea for gifts for each guest, if you're attending a party in which you want to take the host a little something, or if someone has a birthday, you can pop these seeds into a card for an extra little something wonderful. The monarch lives on average four weeks and four generations of monarchs are born over the spring and summer. The last generation, born in late summer, is an exception because it lives six to eight months, long enough to migrate to winter grounds and make a return trip to the southern U.S. in early spring when they breed and complete their lives. I'm going to read to you from page 26 from a magazine-like publication titled Gardening for Birds, Butterflies, and Backyard Wildlife, a specialty publication by Better Homes and Gardens, and it was printed in 2018. I've always loved butterflies, says Wayne, who is co-author with his sister, Judy Burris, of The Life Cycles of Butterflies. Nurturing butterflies is a hobby that Wayne enthusiastically shares with his wife, Christina. On any summer day in their suburban Kentucky backyard, the couple hosts as many as 35 types of butterflies in various stages of their life cycles. Nectar plants lure the winged beauties in and host plants encourage them to linger and lay eggs. That's when Wayne and Christina step in and help Mother Nature with the parenting part. They carefully gather the eggs with the host leaves still attached and take them indoors to their butterfly nursery. Their safeguarding ensures that most of the eggs will hatch into caterpillars. In the wild, only one in 100 will make it to the butterfly stage, Wayne says, but because the couple watches over the whole life cycle, from egg to caterpillar to emergence from the chrysalis, about 97% make it. Each summer, Wayne and Christina guide 400 to 500 butterflies from egg to adulthood. Wow. So collectively, if we think of all three of these things together, birds, butterflies, and hummingbirds, simply getting an attractive grouping of mostly native plants in the ground is a great place to start. When it comes to attracting insects that benefit your yard, there is a whole lot more than just bees and butterflies. You can build a bug hotel out of found items like pine cones, trimmed branches, stones, and hay. There are a zillion ways to go about this, so just ask the Google or Pinterest. This is an excellent activity for kids and teens, too. Here's an idea. If you're in touch with the neighbors, collaborate on plants. For instance, I'm growing some milkweed from seed and I hope to have enough to share with as many neighbors as will plant them. This creates a more widespread, attractive habitat for butterflies and will likely become more successful because of the greater cluster of food and habitat available. If you're growing dill, you can give extra to your neighbors, and if they're growing hostas, maybe you could have one in return. Hostas are lovely for their foliage, but it's their long stems of white or light purple flower spikes that bring in the butterflies to your garden. Think of several homes in a row hosting these beauties. The more homes that have beneficial plants and bushes, the more likely your neighborhood will collectively benefit. Share this particular podcast with all your neighbors and create a mecca for butterflies or hummingbirds or both. What has been your biggest yard success for attracting birds, butterflies, or hummingbirds? Share it with us on the group Facebook page. I wanted to mention an interesting effort by the Audubon Society. To live such high energy lifestyles, hummingbirds must sync their migration and nesting times with the flowering of nectar bearing plants, of course. 
but climate change threatens to throw off this delicate balance with unknown repercussions for hummingbirds. We know that scientific research will be essential for helping us to understand how climate change is affecting hummingbirds and for learning what we can do about it. But it's not that simple. Collecting the necessary scientific data across large areas is difficult and costly. So here's the genius. How can we begin the research necessary to answer important questions related to hummingbirds and climate change? Well, with technology widely available today, we can all become community scientists, spending a few minutes each week to collect data in our own backyard that's available for researchers. For instance, the smartphone in your pocket can be used as a high-tech data collection device complete with GPS, camera, timer, and internet capabilities. By joining the Audubon Hummingbirds at Home, you will join a movement to crowdsource rigorous science that is meaningful for hummingbirds. You'll become an integral piece of a continent-wide network of community scientists helping uncover how hummingbirds are affected by climate change and providing the necessary information to devise actions to help them. You simply download an app available on both Apple and Android platforms, create an account, identify an area that they call a patch, which can be your backyard, a spot in a nearby park, your school playground, or whatever is easy. It just needs to be a place that hummingbirds may visit and that you can survey at least once, but hopefully many times. You simply watch your patch and log what you see. You can also explore data in your area collected by others just like you. You don't have to be a scientist to be involved. I'll put a link in the podcast notes and on the group Home Space and Reason Facebook page. And now for some questions to ask yourself about your outdoor space and your reason. Question number one. Do I have a large flat rock anywhere in my yard? Is it in the sun. If you have a rock, but it's not in a sunny location, can you move it? Butterflies will gather there to spread their wings and warm up. Question number two. Do I have a wall, a fence, a live hedge, something else that will block wind where I can plant butterfly-friendly plants? Question number three, where could I include a water element to my outdoor space? This could be a pond, but it could also be a tiny fountain or a bird bath. I learned that butterflies are very susceptible to drowning, so the source for butterflies needs to be extraordinarily shallow. Question number four. Do I have a variety of nectar-filled flowers and milkweed either on or somewhere near my property? I've put a list of plants that attract those on my Pinterest board, as I said earlier, titled Outdoor Spaces. Make sure you have larval plants and nectar plants that will appeal to butterflies in each stage of their life cycle. Question number five. Here's a checklist. You need three things. Write it down. Food, shelter, and water. Make sure your plans include several options for each category. To attract and keep birds and butterflies around, you must have every box checked. Water, food, and shelter is the basis for attracting all the good things. Each have their own specific needs, but start with the thing you most want to attract and start curating plants and ensuring there is a water source for that one pollinator or bird. See what works and what doesn't. What is most beautiful to you? What suits your aesthetic? You will learn from this year round and tackle this same lovely puzzle next season with fresh eyes and maybe even add another goal like this summer I'm going to add butterflies to my wish list of things to attract. 
Our homes are our constant thing, sort of like the ground that we stand on. It is where we retreat. It is both literally and figuratively where we weather the storms. Everything has an ebb and a flow. Part of life is going through highs and lows, wins and losses. Our home is the thing that should be able to support us on both ends of the extreme. So making your outdoor space all that it can be so it can support you and bring you solace or even escapism is important. Attracting birds, feeding them, watching the life cycle of a butterfly, those are peaceful things, healthy activities where you focus on the marvel that is Mother Nature. If you happen to live in the Portland, Oregon area and you'd like to hire me to list your home and help you find the next one, reach out to me through my social media or my website, spaceandreason.com. I always include free staging for all my clients to help their existing home look its best before photography, video, and open houses. And I also can help buyers envision how homes could be used for their specific family to its best and highest potential. Do you have any feedback? I'd love to hear from you. Send me an email at Christina with a K at spaceandreason.com. You're going to want to join the Facebook group that I mentioned earlier called Home Space and Reason. If you're anything like me, you appreciate visual examples. And so this podcast and that group go hand in hand. If you subscribe and generally listen as the podcasts are released, it's relatively easy to reference the coinciding images. It's also a great place to post your bird, butterfly, and hummingbird photos and celebrations of any kind. If you enjoyed this show, please give me a rating. It lets people know this podcast is worth listening to. I can't wait to hear about your thoughts and how your outdoor plans unfold. Thanks for sitting in on this conversation on the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. I hope you create a home that thrives and a yard that you can enjoy. 